Welcome everyone to Bethesda Green's Innovation Lab Summer Speaker Series, Tackling Environmental Challenges Through Sustainable Entrepreneurship. During this series, we are discussing ideas that impact people, the planet, and profits. My name is Patty Simonton. I'm the director of the Be Green Business Program here at Bethesda Green. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for today's session on green business certifications. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a minute to introduce you to our work here at Bethesda Green, which we organize under two primary categories, Be Green Business and Be Green Living. Be Green Business, sorry, Be Green's Be Green Living program works to elevate community engagement and enhance the quality of life for local residents. Our community projects include efforts to improve stormwater management, promote street level community recycling, and improve access to green space, energy, and transportation. Our environmental leaders program supports environmental education in high school seniors, cultivating the next generation of visionary green leaders. We're lucky that we have the director of our Be Green Living program on our panel today. So Kim, I'm sure we'll be able to answer any questions you have if that comes up later today. Under our Be Green business program, we support leaders who are building for-profit business models around innovative and sustainable solutions to tackle environmental and social challenges. As part of our B Corp program, we advise existing local businesses through B Corp certification and help them discover and implement best practices for sound governance, support for workers, and sustainability. Finally, through our Innovation Lab, we welcome mission-aligned idea stage through seed stage companies that are developing innovations in the areas of environmental sustainability and sustainable food systems. We have developed four distinct programs to provide relevant and timely support to founders including our incubator, accelerator, residency, and amplifier programs. Applications are rolling for both our incubator and our amplifier programs. Applications will open shortly for our spring 2022 accelerator cohort, and interested founders are strongly encouraged to join our incubator as early as possible to benefit from our year-round programming. I invite all founders who are ready to join our exciting and growing community to email me at innovationlab at bethesdagreen.org if you wanna learn more. And finally, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge our amazing network of partners and sponsors for believing in us and the work that we do. Now, I'd like to introduce Caroline Davenport, Bethesda Green's impact intern, who has been working with me this summer to develop this speaker series. Caroline will be graduating this December from the University of Maryland with a Bachelor's of Arts in Public Policy and minors in both Spanish and Sustainability. Previously, she interned at the National Governors Association, researching US surface transportation infrastructure permitting, and at the World Resources Institute, researching digital agriculture advisory services for smallholder farmers in developing countries. She's passionate about creating positive social change and is particularly interested in sustainable development. She'll be facilitating this afternoon's session. And at this point, I'll hand the reins over to her to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much for the introduction, Patty. I'm thrilled to introduce today's panelists. First off, we have Raj Agarwal, who's the founder of Provoke, a communications firm whose vision is a world transformed by equity, beauty, and love. With over 20 years of experience as a communications and technology strategist, he has led internal and external branding, marketing, and customer engagement efforts for more than 450 nonprofits and social impact firms. Raj keeps Provoke rooted in empathy-driven work by forging partnerships with values-aligned visionary leaders committed to social, economic, and racial justice. He has led workshops and talks at dozens of national conferences and continues to play a pivotal role in leading movements, communities, and organizations to be more equitable, inclusive, and aware of personal biases and prejudices. As a lifelong Washingtonian, Raj is deeply rooted in the local community. He serves on the boards of the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, the Nonprofit Technology Enterprise Network, the Washington DC Economic Partnership, and the Ben's Chili Bowl Foundation. He is also the proud recipient of B-Lab's inaugural Anti-Racism and Jedi Impact Award. Second, we have Julia Craighill, who I'm hoping um, <laughs> is able to connect to her audio. I think we're having some technical difficulties, um, but I'll just go ahead with uh, introducing her. She is the founder and president of Ensight, she is a driven, award-winning sustainability expert committed to helping organizations build value through green strategies. With more than three decades of experience in architecture, construction, and sustainability, she collaborates with her clients to align green goals with business goals. She has been a consultant for the Montgomery County Green Business Certification Program for the past seven years. 
She's the first certified BREAM USA in-use assessor in the state of Maryland and one of the first in the country. BREAM certifies commercial and residential buildings on the basis of operational performance. Her ability to navigate the entire process from registration through certification has made her an indispensable partner for owners, managers, and occupiers of existing buildings. A frequent speaker and prolific author on the issues of sustainability and resiliency, Julia is known for her solid, pragmatic guidance that helps organizations make the leap from good intentions to long-term profitable performance. And we have Bethesda Green's very own Kim Gadu Alexander, who is our director of B Green Living and our B Corp programs. In this role, she provides program management and technical environmental expertise for urban planning activities, stormwater projects, and sustainable agriculture awareness. Previously, Kim served on the New Hampshire Granite State Future Climate Change and Energy Efficiency Technical Advisory Committee and was a board president of the Merrimack River Watershed Council. Kim holds an MS in Environmental Science with a concentration in Sustainable Development and Climate Change from Antioch University. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. There are a myriad of green business certifications out there and it seems like more are popping up every day. This can be overwhelming for companies at any stage, but especially for those just getting started, not to mention how confusing it can be for consumers who are trying to make responsible decisions. Today, we're going to try to demystify the who, what, when, where, why, and how of green business certifications. We'll focus on the certifications from B-Lab, the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection, and BREAM. I'd like to start with a few questions for each of you, and then we'll open the conversation to questions from our attendees. Everyone is invited to share your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll aim to answer as many as we can. All right, so let's kick things off. Uh, I would like to start with my first question for Raj. Um, your website states that at Provoke, we envision a world where every progressive organization achieves its mission. Can you please tell us a little bit more about how your organizational vision impacted your decision to pursue a green business certification and why you chose B Corp over other certifications? Thank you, Caroline. Really good to be with you this morning, and especially my dear friend, Kim. So, um, and also for the folks that are in the area, like this weather we've been having is glorious. I'm sure climate change is part of the reason that it's happening, uh, and I can't help but enjoy it. So I hope you get to do that as well. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been a B Corp since, it's basically since its founding, since 2008. And so I could tell you that I was on a journey of really understanding how uh, we as a communications firm could really support um, progressive organizations, small businesses uh, in the DC area back then. And we've going to doing more work nationally and globally. But I found that when I first got introduced to the B Corp movement, when they first introduced themselves in 2007, was that they had articulated so many things that I knew, but couldn't, didn't know how to put into words. And so this organizational vision almost came, the way it's articulated came in after being a part of the B Corp movement that I knew to be what was right for the kind of company that I wanted to create. Um, it was recently reflected to me that as a leader, I am, I'm my, I really lead with my heart and my intuition and, and the words sometimes follow when I see them, uh, which is a tough position to be in in communication. Sometimes the words have to be there first. And so um, at the time of it, it was one of the first, I, I could just see the scale at which they were doing it at. So when they introduced B Corp 13 years ago, they had on stage the head of uh, Method, Seventh Generation, um, earthbound farms, they had a lot of really big names. And so the idea of being a socially responsible business or a sustainable business or a green business at the time was going from being this like nascent idea of small businesses to businesses that were doing business at scale nationally and then eventually globally. And so I feel like that's what I was really drawn to. And um, I could talk more about that, but it's been a really interesting journey with the B Corp movement um, because of the variety of businesses that they have and really seeing how they've um, evolved their practice, both internally and externally on the three major areas that they focus on, which is 
racial equity, climate justice, and uh, shareholder capitalism. So those three things uh, in their current theory of change is what continues to draw me and also to see how we can transform um, capitalism in its entirety. Great, that's um, all very interesting and I am interested in diving more into that. Yeah, and Caroline, if I say anything that is like jargon or doesn't make sense, <laughs> folks, please just please help me clarify, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I found that fascinating and I actually just wanna follow up quickly on since it's been 13 years, has this certification um, paid off in the way that you anticipated? Um, and have there been um, any challenges or costs that you've encountered along the way over the past decade plus? Oh, good question. So I'd say that I'm in, a, in my role and I also play an advisor to B-Lab there is this, um, it's become more of a symbiotic relationship in the sense that we are pushing them to focus more deeply on things like racial equity and climate justice. And as a result, it goes when, when they're, now that they've, now that, that, they, that they have embraced it, it's about how it pushes out to the community. And then the community is, starts to move towards these towards this vision and then what it does for us it helps us to have a clearer understanding of what that means for us and so i know that we're going to talk about this a little later but i find that overall being the only one that does it something has a quote unquote competitive advantage but we're only going to achieve transformation when we're all doing it together and so, um, and then it's about, well, and then how do you pull even further ahead on that? And so that's what I think it is. I think that the way that capitalism and um, other things have thought about is that you just do the thing and you're done and you check the box. And I feel like these certifications, uh, if they need to evolve as the world evolves and as we learn more to continue pushing us to be even better and better stewards in society. I love how you describe that as a symbiotic relationship. I'm curious to see if that holds up for some of the other certifications that we're going to discuss today. Um, Julia, I'd love to direct this next question to you um, about the Montgomery County Green Business Certification. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on how this might compare to um, an internationally recognized certification like B Corp. Um, and what would you say to founders who are weighing the costs and benefits of a local certification versus a bigger name certification? I can also come back to Julia if she's still having technical difficulties. Julia, I'm not it, sure. it looks like you're muted. Um, I'll see if you can unmute from here. Caroline, can you hear me? I can Great. hear you now. Great. Oh, very interesting. I'm over the phone. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I reached out to my IT, which is my son. We had to do a root something, something to get it working in the first place. So obviously I need new equipment. Um, anyhow, so uh, to the Montgomery County Green Business Certification, um, how does it compare to international? I would say that it is more simple. Uh, it's got a very narrow scope. It's called the Montgomery County Green Business Certification, um, but it actually, in my mind, is a, an office or workplace certification. Um, and I guess, you know, I should stop and back up by saying that I've been the consultant to Montgomery County coaching um, businesses through this application process and then doing on-site visits to ensure that they're doing what they said they're doing for seven years. So, um, and so as a uh, workplace certification, it's really focused on that. It's also primarily a checklist uh, of actions that are pretty simple um, and, and self-explanatory in many ways. Although there is also a continuous improvement um, 
action plan that you have to create that I think aligns with uh, other um, sort of uh, international um, sort of ISO and other certifications along those lines. Um, about local, I think it's really important for companies to show up where they are. And I'm actually borrowing that expression from a friend, uh, Mary Fellig, who some of you may know, who, who said that to Marriott, who was actually uh, one of the very first companies to become certified. You know, this is a big global company, but they also have a responsibility to show up at home. Um, and I think that you are really supported in a way that you aren't by the fact that they've hired a consultant to coach you through this certification. So I'll stop there and not ramble on. No, that's great. That's a, a really good comparison of the two. Um, I think that makes it very clear about the costs and benefits of each. Um, and I wanted to follow up on a question with your other certification that you're trained in, which is BREAM, um, which is more of a green building certification than green business certification. But I still think it's incredibly relevant to this conversation as founders are weighing um, various ways of um, getting third parties to validate their data and practices. Um, so you're the first certified BREAM USA in use assessor in Maryland and one of the first in the US. And I'm really curious why you chose to get involved with BREAM rather than LEED um, or another competing green building certification, um, given that you also have experience working with LEED in the past. Thank you. Um, hey, you put it really well. I, I, I started out my career as an architect and then I became a, did manage general construction and then I became a director of sustainability for the construction development. Um, uh, company that I work for. So I've been in this arena. I was in 2002. I became lead. That was before there was an AP designation. I was just lead. So I was an early adopter there. I think I tend to be on the bleeding edge rather rather than the leading edge on many things. Um, and I was very excited when I uh, in early 2001 when I went to the first lead. Um, rollout because I had done a green building before, that's a long story, and I really felt like LEED expanded the view of green building as well as made it accessible by, frankly, avoiding some of the uh, thorny issues that um, really there wasn't enough data, but that's a whole nother discussion. So um, I was in new construction, but my job as director of sustainability exposed me to the management side of the buildings that we had. And as I've gone through, you know, uh, my career, I've realized that people love the new shiny um, sort of sexy moves that one can make, but really where we need to be focused is on existing buildings. So number one, BREAM or BREAM, uh, you can say it either way, is um, for existing buildings. It's analogous to lead existing building operations and maintenance, but I feel that it's far superior uh, to that for many reasons. I'll just put a few of them, and I, I think I want to also just back up by saying it is, uh, GREAM is the original um, green building certification system. Um, it is 10 years older than LEED, and uh, it's out of the UK. It's very science-based. Um, it has lots of certifications globally, and, you know, it's very, very credible. Um, so here are a few things that I like about uh, BREAM in use. It's very, it comes down to flexibility. If you look on my website, I wrote a blog back in 2017 about this. There are, um, there are not no prerequisites. You do have to have basic building data about water and energy, but other than that, there are no prerequisites. So it's a lot of credits, credits. it's wide open to you to select what is of best value to you. It's available to a wide range of building types um, and actually residential. It used to be just commercial, um, but now um, residential is available to the BREAM in use. Now, I will have to say that BREAM has the full suite 
stepping back a moment, has the full suite of certifications that LEED does. It has new construction, it has interiors, it has community, which is analogous to uh, neighborhoods, it has tenant fit out, et cetera. Um, but their BREAM and use um, is applicable to all commercial building types and uh, multifamily and multi-unit residential. Um, and because it's so flexible, it can be applied to any building. For instance, the city of Stockholm benchmarked their entire 69 um, building uh, resident uh, portfolio, real estate portfolio to BREAM in use. And that included a pump house from the 1600s. So very flexible. Another flexible part is that you've got two parts. One looks at the asset performance and the other looks at building management. And you can either certify to both or the other. And I think that is what, when we, with that two part reflects a real uh, acknowledgement of what it takes to manage a building, which is something that I don't see in LEED EBOM. So I'll stop there. That's a fascinating perspective. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Mary Lynn, I see your question in the chat and I'm going to incorporate that into um, my next two questions, which are directed towards Kim about B Corp and um, certifications like that. So Kim, I'd like to ask you, um, what advice would you give to an early stage founder who's weighing various green business certifications? Um, like what are the considerations they need to um, take into account on a fundamental level? And then how do you see a certification like B Corp impacting a company's growth strategy? Yeah, thanks for that question, Caroline. So um, just to clarify for everybody, um, as the Be Green Living Director for Bethesda Green, um, I am responsible for maintaining all of our, our business certifications. So just so everybody knows, Bethesda Green is a Montgomery County Green Business Certified Business, and we've worked with Julia um, over the years, um, which has been a great experience. Um, we're also Green America Gold Certified. Um, and then we're also a member of the Alliance for the Bay, which is a program um, from uh, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is a nonprofit organization based out in Annapolis. Um, and then we also run a lot of uh, B Corps initiatives. So in terms of green business certification, Bethesda Green has had a number of different interactions with different types of certifications. Um, in terms of entrepreneurs, I would say I would ask an entrepreneur what their goals are. Um, and also if it's a new business, I would absolutely encourage them to start small. So um, I think I saw one of the questions that popped up in the chat was asking about cost. So the Montgomery County Green Business Certified certification is free. Um, and they provide that consulting support through through Julia, um, which has been really fantastic. So the businesses can get that uh, that sustainability advice that they're looking for. Um, some entrepreneurs know specifically that they want to go right for B Corp certification because they know that it's going to give them that that uh, competitive edge that Raj was talking about. Um, so they're ready to dedicate uh, staff time and capacity and some some funds. The B Corp certification is not free. Um, the tool is free, the BIA, the B Impact Assessment is free, um, but to get certified, it requires um, a, a company to, um, a new requirement is um, a, hundred, a cost of $150 when applying for certification, and then there's an annual fee after that. Um, so for, for a new entrepreneur, I would encourage them to look at what's local, which we've already talked about, look at what certifications are local. Also see um, if their customers are interested in any sort of specific certification. Um, if, a, if the company is going for any sort of uh, contract of any kind where ISO certification might be necessary, um, I would encourage them to look, at, to look at those sorts of things and identify what their goals are. Thank you. Um, I think that really answers Mary Lynn's question and my question. So two birds with one stone, but Mary Lynn, if there's um, any other specifics that you want to get into, feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, so getting more into that competitive edge that you both have been talking about, um, it's frequently green business certifications of all kinds are frequently touted as a way to make one's company and product stand out against competition. And through your work advising um, companies through B Corp certification, have you found this to be true? And do you feel that this is more true for certain industries. Is, are there certain industries for which getting B Corp certification matters more than others? 
Um, Raj can also answer this question because he's a B Corp certified company. Um, so he might have a different perspective on it. Um, I would, it, it's, again, it really depends on the company. So as a consumer myself, um, when I'm going grocery shopping, I'll give an example. I look for companies that are B Corp certified on the products that I buy. So I'm looking for seventh generation. I'm looking for method products. Uh, there are a number of other food products. There's goat cheeses out there that are now B Corp certified. So as a consumer myself, um, I'm able to educate other consumers on what on what it means. So some, for some companies, um, it's absolutely appropriate and it helps give them a, a competitive advantage against their industry peers. Um, for some companies, I mean, I'm going to be 100% honest, there's a lot of people that don't know about B Corp certification. It is a growing, a growing certification around the world, but there's still a lot of work to be done um, for businesses and in, this, in specific industries. Some of the companies that I've helped um, have not necessarily been manufacturing. Two of them have been accounting firms that really want to work with local, other local companies, um, and they see as getting uh, B Corp certified as their competitive advantage against their industry peers, um, because B Corp certification is not really big in the accounting world. So it, it really depends on the entrepreneur what they're looking for, and then also how they want to how they want to um, message that out to their customers um, and the consumers. Thank you for tying in both the consulting perspective and the consumer perspective. Raj, is there anything you want to build off of on that? Yeah, this is what I, I guess what I kind of said earlier is I think that this is going to just start being the Annie at the table. And Carolyn, I want to ask you about this because I remember when we first met, you said, you know, people, if you don't mind me saying younger people, um, are more considerative these things than, uh, you know, uh, I would say older consumers. Would you mind speaking a little bit about your personal experience around that and what people are choosing and, and, and why? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, well, through this internship, I found out about B Corp. I had never heard of it before. And now when I go to the grocery store, I see the little symbol on the packaging. Um, and so I've gotten a lot of, out of this internship in more ways than one. Um, but I think it's, um, I don't know if concerning is the right word, but I think of myself as um, like maybe a little bit more educated than the average consumer on this issue, just because I care so much. And it's the field in which um, I want to go into after I graduate. Um, certainly not an expert by any means, but the fact that I um, wasn't aware of certain green business certifications like that um, makes me, um, makes me more motivated to spread this information to um, people in my network, whether that be friends, family, um, anybody really. Um, and that actually, I want to <laughs> tie this into a question I had uh, later on, but since we're talking about consumers, um, I think another um, component that ties into this and maybe makes it all a little bit more complicated is just the proliferation of green business certifications. Um, like even Amazon has one now and Amazon is most definitely not <laughs> a green company or, um, so do we think, um, and feel free for anybody to jump in on this one, um, that this proliferation in recent years, especially has it all diluted their meaning or relevancy for consumers, especially given the prevalence of greenwashing, it can be really hard to know, um, which certifications are valid um, versus which are um, a bit more uh, for PR's sake. So are you referring to Amazon's climate pledge friendly certification? Is that the one you're referring to? Yeah, well, yeah. And specifically within that, they have the um, compact by design, which yeah. is a really targeted um, certification for anyone who hasn't heard about it. It's um, focused on packaging and reducing packaging waste. Um, so I think it's actually a great initiative. I hate to give Amazon props, <laughs> but I will give them props for that one. Um, and that's just one example of one that I've seen um, pop up in, in recent years. Um, but overall, I would say the movement um, for green business certifications has kind of just exploded. Like I'm sure um, since you first started working with B Corp 13 years ago, you've seen a lot of changes in this field. I have, and I'm really interested. I actually didn't even know that Amazon had done that. And at first my reaction would be like, no, this is not a good thing. But at the same time, that means that they see value 
in these certifications and they also see that val- they must see value in people like you, Carol- Caroline, and Caroline and other people making their decisions based on this certification and therefore they've invested in knowing that it could result in greater sales for their company uh, because people are being more discerning about it. So let's not make any mistake about it that they have to see that they not only see the it's the right thing to do, hopefully, but also that there's a value proposition for them over time. So this makes me think like it's a good thing um, because, and I also saw the different partners that they have are various partners that uh, have influenced this field for, for decades and newer folks like the Regenerative Organic Alliance um, or the Regen- what's it called Regenerative Organic Certified, which was started by a number of B Corps actually to really change how they even define um, organic. So I'm really, I'm actually emboldened by that. I also think like, um, as Kim kind of alluded to, various, you know, the B Corp certification is extremely rigorous. It takes a lot of time. Um, Small businesses may not have the time to go through and actually go through that process. And also there's a cost associated with it as well. Um, So these are all things that could be hindrances, even though B Lab is figuring out ways to make their product more accessible. And they often find that, even just going through the B Corp certification process, which is the B impact assessment, is an, as a way for you to go through and just see where you land when it comes to your score. Um, and you don't, that doesn't mean you have to become a B Corp as a, as a result of that. You could just use it as your own internal metric. Um, and Kim talks, uh, does a lot of workshops on these as well about what it means to become a B Corp and things like this. So they've had like hundreds of thousands of businesses go through the B, B impact assessment and only I think 4,000 or 7,000 globally that are actually B Corps. So you can see the value there. But again, I think that some of them, um, like the Montgomery County one, are more accessible uh, to that. And also speaking to Julia's point, um, I think that showing that they are doing both a, any company is doing both a, a larger national or global certification along with a local certification can really indicate that they understand what's valuable and important to their community, um, no matter what their footprint is. And they should be thinking about doing that not only where they're located, which is essential, but every place where is a part of their supply chain. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think it's an issue of scale. So some of the companies that I work with um, are really want to focus on those local certifications, which I think is great. And some companies, to be honest with you, have done no sustainability initiatives ever in their life cycle. So um, some of those homegrown certifications or those smaller certifications can really meet a business where they are. So like having somebody like Julia come in and guide a business on even beginning steps on how to maybe create a recycling program that your company might not have may, that might be, you know, something innate to a lot of us now, but some businesses don't consider that have not considered that. So I think it's an issue of scale too, which is one of the reasons why um, I don't feel like there's a dilution in in having a, a multiple certifications because I think that by offering a lot of different types of certifications you can really meet a business where they are so like the businesses for the bay program that the alliance for the Chesapeake Bay offers is really fantastic for businesses that are you know surrounding the Chesapeake Bay and wanting to support water quality initiatives so um, I just wanted to add that as well yeah I love that idea you brought up of meeting businesses where they are I think that's really important to talk about Julia were you going to say something yeah um yeah, just to build on what Kim has said, um, well, or to actually I, I, to bring in something else, we should distinguish between single attribute uh, certifications and multi attribute cert- certifications. Or so the Amazon is a, is around packaging. B Corp, Montgomery County Green Business, uh, well, B Corp even more looks at the entire business model of that. Um, of that company. And I, I feel like that's fundamentally different. Um, and th- you really hit a chord because I'm writing some training on, on um, purchasing right now. And the number of certifications that are sort of these single or several attribute uh, relative to things that you buy at, or how they're packaged is just unbelievable. It's just has taken me forever because there's so much information out there. So I don't think it dilutes B Corps because in my view, and I'm not an expert, B Corps is is one of the uh, the few out there that really look at the business model. And I think you should also, and, and I'd be interested what the other panelists think on this, but I think you should, 
when we look at on the building side, the investors are really driving things. Blackstone has come out very strongly. And I've got to think that even on the business side, getting investment is going to be increasingly uh, um, easier if you are a green business. I'm glad um, that you made that distinction. I do think um, that's really important. And to kind of build off of what you just said about this uh, green business certifications becoming increasingly relevant for multiple stakeholders, not just consumers, but investors as well. Um, I wanted to direct this question to all of you. Um, based on what you've encountered in your work, do you believe that green business certifications will in some way, shape or form become required of businesses in the near or long-term future? And do you see any changes legislative or otherwise coming down the pipeline that our audience should be aware of? Well, I'll jump in since I broached the topic. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, I, I see that in the future, actually. Um, LEED has become required as building code. Um, and I, I think this is going, I think that's a precedent that's going to extend to other certifications. Um, and certainly it's going to be a phased so that it's, it's a preferential when, uh, sort of requirement. And then I think it is going to, to move into uh, more of a uh, legislated to regulated sort of, um, sort of thing. That's, if I look in the crystal ball, that's what I see. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Marilyn, for adding that in the chat. Yeah, that makes sense. Requirements, cost, equity. Um, this is another question for all of you. Um, have you found that the process of obtaining a green business certification has helped protect companies from some of the risks associated with climate change, supply chain disruptions, or any other problems with resiliency or agility? Um, in essence, can it be a form of risk management because it forces a company to take certain steps when they're complying with the various um, standards of the green business certification? It's supposed to. Uh, one of the, also the other reasons that this is supposed to happen is that, um, you know, businesses in certain places can choose by changing their bylaws or becoming a benefit corporation uh, that they're beholden to their shareholder, to their stakeholders and not to their shareholders. And so we've heard about businesses before, including business like Ben and Jerry's that maybe at the time uh, they wouldn't have sold to Unilever, even though that's turned out to be really a great option for them. Um, at the time, there wasn't, a, there isn't a way in which corporate structures are created that allows them to make these choices. So I think a lot of the policy work that different groups have been doing to allow for them to make different choices besides what the law would previously dictate, not only has an impact on what choices they make, definitely what they want to do around climate change mitigation and around uh, impacting their supply chain. So I think all these things are work together and um, there's a specific policy and legal part of the work that also helps to make sure that, um, that, that it sustains. Because, you know, I remember the first time, sometimes when you share the idea of a socially responsible business or a sustainable business with people, um, I remember one time I was testifying in front of a, a DC council member and when I told them about B, about you know being um, about benefit corps or about being a socially responsible business, they're like, why wouldn't any business want to do that? Um, and then secondly, um, we do a lot of work on this campaign called Imperative 21. It's a global campaign to reset capitalism with seven of the largest uh, basically groups, business groups that focus on CSR or socially responsible business. Um, and they represent about 70,000 businesses plus, but what we're really finding is that within businesses, CEOs and other people in decision-making um, positions don't have the cover often needed to allow them to make these choices because you would say that their peers, which is kind of an old boys network, uh, doesn't allow them to make those choices because it's considered to be weak or bad business. And so I think that we're just hopefully, you know, 
um, as the folks at the Roosevelt Institute say, rewriting the rules of what um, of what business can look like and how it can conduct itself. So we have to do it. So I would say yes. And there's a lot more work that needs to be done because often profit uh, supersedes any other business choice. Yeah, yeah, perfectly said. I, um, as a shameless plug, if you wanna hear more about risk management, um, our session next week uh, is all about um, climate risk management. And I'm curious to see um, if the topic of green business certifications will come up there because um, I do think there's some inter interesting intersections between the two. Um, and moving right along. Oh, Julia, can I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. I'd like to jump in because this is where Bream shines. Um, of the uh, nine sections that are, uh, you can select issues from, one is resilience. Um, and you, you're looking at flood risk assessment, alarm systems, emergency plans, and climate-related physical risks, social risks and opportunities even security risk um, in that, uh, even under asset, uh, even under sort of asset performance, um, you're looking at condition surveys, uh, which really is uh, about resilience. So, and robustness is how they like to uh, refer to a sort of building that can withstand pressures. So uh, that's one place. Um, it also lo looks at pollution, which is, um, another, uh, you know, risky uh, activity for any industry or business or building. So uh, I would say that Briam it really has taken the lead in this regard. I'm really glad you jumped in with that perspective. Um, I, I think that's a great point that um, definitely makes even clearer the benefits that some of these certifications can have um, for your business. Um, I just plugged uh, next week's session, but actually for a second, I want to back up to a point that was brought up uh, two weeks ago in our first session, um, which was about sustainability reporting frameworks for impact investing. And um, the topic of green business certifications was organically brought up in the a conversation between the panelists. And um, they all had uh, different perspectives on it. Um, and so I wanted to share two of those because um, I think they brought up some interesting points. We've talked a lot about the benefits um, that these certifications can have. Um, and for anyone out there who might be wondering, well, what could be the downsides or does it apply to my business? Any kind of like uh, doubts uh, about any of that. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about one of the panelists was um, a small business owner herself, and she had been um, B Corps certified and then decided against re-upping because um, she felt that the time and resources necessary weren't, um, didn't make sense for her. Um, and I was wondering, Kim, Raj, what would you say to founders who feel similarly about um, that with B Corp? And then Julia, um, in, a, in a discussion that we had previously with Doug, who's involved with the Montgomery County Green Business Certification, he had shared kind of uh, similar stories about businesses with that certification um, and they, their same thought process. So um, what would you, all three of you say to founders who might have been on board at one point um, and have changed direction since? Um. So I guess I'll address um, part of your question just from the Bethesda Green perspective. So Bethesda Green um, doesn't qualify for a lot of business certifications because we're a nonprofit. So we can't become B Corps certified. So we are limited in the types of certifications that we are allowed to apply for. Um, so we have to take advantage of the certifications when they are available to us. So keeping that in mind, I think so for some businesses, um, and Julia can speak to this about the green business certification. For some businesses, it's in it might be an issue of you know companies aren't aren't necessarily seeing those those customers come in based specifically on that certification. Um, but for us, it's really about um, walking our talk, and so we want to make sure that we walk our talk in in being being a sustainably focused business. Um, so in some instances. Um, I've had one or two companies tell me that they didn't necessarily receive 
uh, the the um, the customer draw that they thought that they were going to when they became B Corps certified. But I said before um, that there's still a lot of people that don't know about B Corps certification. Um, so just because they become certified doesn't mean that the customers don't necessarily value um, the time and the effort that they're putting into maintaining their values. Raj might also have some more insights about that question. Thank you for that, Kim. Yeah, yeah I think um, one is maybe there's, there are definitely gonna be groups that have re realized their value through these certifications and it, they don't need to be in it in perpetuity. And at the same time, I think that, I don't remember whether it was in our earlier conversation or this one, but I said that, you know, these certifications are meant to evolve and meant to challenge. And so uh, just like deep racial equity work or life, uh, we are here to learn and to grow and not check the box. And therefore, um, I think these certifi the certificate, if the certification should be doing that, and therefore we can see value in them because they are evolving. So, um, yeah, but um, yeah, thank you. So I want to jump in with a story that um, I've uh, maybe, maybe somebody's heard before. Um, first of all, I want to frame it with JLL has a 330-300 workplace rule. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it basically says um, for every square foot of space, a company will spend $3 on utilities, 30 for rent, and 300 on payroll. So the money in a larger company is, is, is your staff. It's attracting talent, it's retaining talent. Um, that's, but it's harder to track, so it, it's left out of this discussion. Um, I did have a very interesting discussion with an accounting firm that um, was recertifying. They're one of the very first, um, and uh, I, I won't use their name, although she actually has told this, uh, I've told this story while she was around, um, and I, I was really amazed. She did such a great job. They, uh, they just were on top of every issue, and I showed my skepticism. Uh, I think uh, my bias by saying, "So you're an accounting firm? How is why is this important for you?" She goes, "Are you kidding me? We have, um, you know, people come in who are interviewing." Talent attraction is very big for us. And they ask about our green um, operations and what we're doing. And um, so, so that I don't think should be dismissed as, as really a, a big value of just basically being green in your, in your business. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. I do think that is a big piece of the puzzle. It's not just about the customers. It's also about um, employee recruitment and retention. Um, and that um, the 333, three, I, I don't, I can't remember what you called it, 330, 300. Um, that's really yeah. interesting and ties into um, a question I had for you, Julia, about of course, I had to throw a pandemic question in here because it's just turned the world upside down, <laughs> changed everything. Um, and so I wanted to uh, kind of inquire about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the calculus for companies as they weigh whether to pursue BRIAM or another um, green building certification, given that um, we've heard stories of many companies that are deciding to downsize their office space or start sharing office space or even get rid of a physical location altogether. So I'm curious what you see happening one, five, 10 years from now with green building certifications. Well, um, yeah, that's, it, that's interesting. Uh, also for Montgomery County Green Business or anything that deals with the workplace, because again, there's that uncertainty about the workplace. Um, the uh, BRIAM is, is increasing in the U.S. more slowly than I would like, um, and particularly it is in um, what, they, what is termed the, the industrial sector, but it's actually warehouse. So one effect of COVID is that with people increasingly um, buying from Amazon and others, distribution centers are becoming uh, a hot real estate com commodity. And so... Um, 
every RFP I've seen come out uh, for BREAM in use has been um, around the, the warehouse sector. So I think you will find uh, backing off um, a little bit from offices, although uh, Washington Re just decided to do a large part of their portfolio, um, which are offices. Um, but you're, but you're going to see it, but it's increasing in another sector. So I think it's going to be fluid and I don't think it's going away. Yeah, it sounds like more of a pivoting um, than disappearing, um, which is good. We want it to stick around. <laughs> um, so, and it sounds very needed. Um, you made the great point that as we're relying more heavily on, um, on online orders, um, this is important. Um, and I see a comment from Bethesda Green from Patty in the chat. Um, and so I want to ask that. Uh, and it kind of ties into another question I had um, coming up anyways. So Patty's question is, um, are certifications as needed um, when there are also a bunch of various reporting frameworks that companies use? And can you expand on the role of certifying organizations to validate the data that companies collect? And anyone can take this question. Uh, I'll jump in from the real estate side. Um, there is a, uh, uh, an investor tool called GREZ um, that uh, is um, becoming increasingly prevalent in the real estate industry. Uh, it was de developed in the Netherlands, but the certification is being handled by uh, GBCI, which is a part of US GBC, which has LEED. Um, and that's probably more detail than you need to know. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things that, that a real estate company needs to report on. Um, and a green certification is, does help them in, their, in that certification. So I do think that's driving some of the green building um, also well and fit well and, and other building related certifications are included in that. If anyone else wants to jump in on that question, feel free. I was um, wanting to ask about um, how, you know, if companies still aren't convinced that a green um, business certification is right for them, um, but still want to commit to sustainability, um, how can the company ensure that it's effective and data driven in its approach despite lacking that third party verification of that data? Um, and moreover, just as a, an overarching question, what is the value of having a data-driven approach? Uh, which stakeholders does this matter to and why? I think, uh, you know, two things that come up. One is uh, Mary Lynn has been so active on the chat and that's so nice to see engagement in that way. Thank you for supporting us in that way. Uh, but I think it has to come down to what government is willing to do and require of their businesses um, and versus looking for loopholes to make it easier, quote unquote, for them to do business in certain ways. You're doing great, Mary Lynn. Um, they, I think it's a requirement in order for them to have, uh, understand that they're gonna have, they have a deep impact on our company. And I think that there is negative rhetoric around asking businesses to do this, puts too much pressure on them and therefore makes it costly for them to do it and actually and ends up making it them ha having less profitability when actually what we've seen is that an investment in these decisions actually returns greater return over time, but not in the short term. So we really have to think more longitudinally. And then if that's the case, and again, as Mary Lynn provided here, uh, really thinking about based on requirements, costs, and equity, is that if it becomes cost prohibitive for whatever folks that need to do that, specifically from an equity standpoint, how do we provide them a safety net to allow them to do it? Because just like an investment in, um, in any sort of investment that all of our cities take, uh, that there will be a return on investment that we can actually calculate a lot more than any of the um, tax uh, opportunities that we provide to large businesses for relocating here that we know at the end of the day don't return anything that they claim that they're going to do in the first place. Um, and then as far as measurement goes, I think the other part of it is, again, government can demand some of these things and or provide programs with incentives for them um, beyond, uh, you know, reduction on certain taxes. But um, also, like we talked about earlier, Caroline, 
I think it's going to, I, my hope is, and it's been for a long time that people choose businesses because they understand that they are being accountable. Um, and therefore uh, the market, as they say, will determine who, you know, succeeds and who does not. Yeah. One thing I also want to plug here at this time is that there's um, a group called Policy Link that's been partnered with um, Just Capital and FSG, and they released this thing called the corporate, the um, Blueprint for Racial Equity, um, and the CEO Blueprint for Racial Equity. And this is an, an, a tool, this is um, a blueprint, and I think eventually will become a measurement for how businesses are able to track their work specifically on racial equity, which impacts all of these things. Thank you for plugging that. Um, maybe Patty can put a uh, link to that in the chat. Um, I want to build on that um, with, let me get up on my soapbox for a minute here, bear with me. <laughs> um, but as a member of Gen Z, I know we were talking about this a little bit earlier as me kind of speaking as a representative of folks from my generation. Um, I, can only, I can only do that a little bit, but I think I can speak to some of the common anxieties of my generation around the climate and capitalism. And especially given that on average, we'll, we will have far less wealth and disposable income um, than previous generations. And we are on the whole acutely aware of the worsening effects of climate change. So these are some of the main factors contributing to the cause for more conscious consumerism and just a reduction in consumption overall. So my question is, um, how much do you think that green business certifications matter in the fight against climate change? And are green business certifications enough to ensure that companies step up and do the right thing? Anyone can take this, but I was feeling like Raj might really have some thoughts on this. I'd love to hear from the other folks a little bit before I answer, yeah. Yeah, please jump in, Kim or Julia, if you have any thoughts on this. I thought on everything, so I'll jump in. So, oh, Kim, you want to go? No, go ahead, Julie. Uh, okay. I was just out in the Pacific Northwest hiking with my two kids who have relocated out there. And if it's ever tangible to look at uh, Mount Rainier and see the great loss of snow that it has right now, um, it's it. It's really palpable, and uh, and you know the wildfires, and they're really experiencing it firsthand, and they're very upset about it. Um, I'll just jump on the green business sort of on the certifications. You know, I've been in the certification uh, realm since the early 2000s, and I don't think that they are the best accountability mechanism. Um, but I do think they are the best way to raise consciousness. And I think you cannot, I always say culture trumps everything. Um, there's no simple mechanistic um, solution. People have to become aware. And I, I think that green business, uh, or uh, excuse me, certifications are a big part of raising that awareness because it not only raises the awareness of the issue, but of ways that that issue can be solved. solved. Yeah, I think on that point of um, raising awareness, my hope for green business certifications is that um, they empower consumers to make responsible choices by putting the information into their hands and trusting that they will use that um, to make an informed decision um, with their purchases. Kim, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, so um, as Patty mentioned, um, when we first started that um, I run our environmental leaders program, which is a school year long internship with um, some high school area seniors um, in our area. So I get to spend a entire school year um, listening to the concerns of 17 and 18 year olds um, in our region. And um, most of them are interested in the newly released climate action plan from Montgomery County. A lot of them are very concerned about environmental impacts. They um, are interested in businesses that are um, supporting the environment and they have those exact same concerns that you mentioned, Caroline. So um, from, from that perspective, um, it's really interesting to me to see the intersection of those folks trying to learn about what it means to work um, while also having the 
um, emotional wherewithal to figure out what's going on in the world around climate and around green business. Um, I will say this, I think that green business certification can provide a great on-ramp for businesses. As I mentioned, I don't, not all businesses um, know about different types of certifications. There are a number of businesses that um, I've worked with in the past that are doing really amazing green things and not telling anybody. So they don't necessarily have a certification or they haven't found a certification that's right for them. Um, but the young people that I work with wanna know what they're doing. So it's, it's been a really interesting way to see what young folks want to hear from businesses. And I think that green business certifications can, whichever one you choose, can provide a really nice on-ramp to helping create metrics that you're going to use maybe for marketing to say what you're doing in the community um, and to, as Julie mentioned, to help attract talent. So I hope that wasn't too easy. No, that's great. Yeah, I think um, that is a great point you brought up about being an on-ramp, kind of tying into the point you made earlier about meeting businesses where they are. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to um, be transparent with your um, customers and other stakeholders, um, and a good way to communicate your successes to customers, um, because like you said, they do want to know, I think. Yeah, the only thing I, just about this um, part about um, having less income um, and disposable income at that, I, I'm, what an interesting question. Um, I heard uh, someone tell me that young people are less likely to buy homes uh, just because they're not, you know, just because of, I, I have no idea actually. And so uh, how does that change overall uh, consumer habits? It sounds really interesting if I just think about this like longitudinally, like what has happened almost like the last 40 years between like fashion and climate change and globalization and fast fashion. Like has this all just been like a thing that was possible in this like window, uh, but actually just the market won't allow for it to continue or will people find ways to make that happen? Just talking out loud here. I haven't had my coffee yet. So I'm, this is just, yeah, just thinking about this out loud. Like what happens there? What choices do people make uh, as a result of that? Uh, what's important for them to have or not to have? No, I love hearing these thoughts. This is what I think about in my free time. I'm a really fun person to be around, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> um, well, I... As we're wrapping up, I want to be conscious of time. Um, to our attendees, please drop any um, questions or comments in the chat. Um, and I do want to give all three of you a couple minutes each to just wrap up with any um, thing you want to say that we haven't covered, um, or and like just drive home like one or two messages that you want our audience to know about green business certifications and to take away from this conversation. <laughs> I guess I'll start. Um, I think that I would love if businesses asked for help, if they are unsure about where to start, reach out. The DC governments and Montgomery County governments and all the way up to Annapolis, um, they have staff, really dedicated, hardworking staff that help businesses um, if they want to either get green certified or if they're interested in finding out more resources, um, I think businesses should not be afraid to ask. If you have never started a sustainability initiative in the history of the business, that's okay. It's it's okay to start, you know, from square one. Or if your business suddenly heard from an intern that there's this great new thing that they're really attracted to, that the business should listen to um, to the younger folks that they want to attract talent to. And if that starts with asking questions, I would just encourage. Um, businesses to ask questions. And if they end up doing a certification, great. If they don't, then they can always find out more resources on either how to get started or how maybe they could even improve their business, um, improve their business to, um, you know, maybe drive more profits or, or create a, an inclusive economy for more customers. Um, so I would just start with asking questions and I was, I would encourage businesses to um, reach out to definitely the local governments who have a lot of really hard working, dedicated staff doing a lot of this work. I think that, oh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Caroline. 
I was just gonna say, I think that's great advice, Kim, especially since this is such an evolving space. Um, like there's so much to learn about this topic, especially since things keep changing and growing. So thank you for that advice. Raj, take it away. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, um, Kim leads workshops on B Corp certification in particular. So I would really suggest that you all take, um, you know, to check it out and learn more about it that way. I also uh, like that the part, whoever commented uh, this idea of just um, sh sharing your green efforts, large and small. Thanks, thanks, Julia. And then lastly, try out one of these certifications and just go through answering the questions. It doesn't mean you have to do it, uh, but I mean, just like take a sense of where you are, just do like a help you to do um, internal analysis uh, of where of where you are in, in this. And maybe there are just some areas that you want to improve on based on what's important to you. Yes, and to sort of phrase what's already been said, but somewhat differently, um, the world does not need a couple of businesses doing things perfectly. They don't need a couple of like outstanding platinum buildings. They need everyone doing a little imperfectly. And so the point is just to start. Um, yes, I think there's nothing better really than looking at an existing certification and just cherry picking those things that you can do. Start somewhere um, because even your smaller um, efforts do have impact when multiplied by millions. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And everyone at any level can do something. Um, and especially since we, as we talked about earlier, there's a plethora of certifications out there on a local level, national, global, and then even industry specific ones. Um, at, at least asking the questions about those is a great place to start as you all have been saying. Um, Kim, do you want to um, talk about best for DMV? Sure, shamelessly plug my program. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> as Raj has already done for me uh, several times. So um, the Bethesda Green um, is a member of the Best for DMV uh, campaign, which is where we are um, bringing businesses together to learn more about um, benchmarking your social and environmental performance using um, an impact tool from B-Lab, either using the B-Impact Assessment or the SDG Action Manager. Um, if folks want more information, Patty, I think put it in the chat. Um, you can register on our Eventbrite. If you have questions, you can feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, I answer questions all the time, so no question is, uh, is, is too small. Um, but we have, um, it's basically a three-part series, or if folks want to do more one-on-one -on -one coaching, I we also offer that as well. Um, and the workshops, you'll start with just the B-Core 101 um, and just start um, learning about what it means just to start benchmarking your social and environmental performance, which is where a lot of businesses are, just starting to learn what it means to benchmark your, your social and environmental performance. So if folks have questions, they can feel ready to reach out. Thank you, Kim. Well, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so I will um, take this opportunity to just let you know that there are two more sessions in our summer speaker series coming up um, over the next couple of weeks. The next one is uh, next week. Um, and I just want to sincerely thank our three expert panelists for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. This has been a fascinating conversation um, for me, and I hope our attendees found this conversation as illuminating and meaningful as I did. Um, and to our attendees, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to attend. Um, please feel free to follow up with um, me at Bethesda Green or Patty um, with any questions. And um, as well, a recording of this session will be available online and I will be writing up a blog post summary of what was discussed today um, to just drive home those major takeaways since I think we heard some great advice here today and some great insights. So thank you all. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. And thank you, Caroline, for setting us up for success and being such a wonderful facilitator <laughs> and helping to seed these, some of the topics that we talked about today. Thank you so much. All right, Thank bye you. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>